Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first uh, program of 2015. Um, our speaker this morning is Brie Arthur uh, from Kipwe Maria, um, but originally from Michigan. Uh, she studied landscape design at Purdue University and moved to North Carolina in 2002. Uh, while here in North Carolina, she has worked at Montrose uh, Gardens with, with Nancy Goodwin in Hillsboro, uh, Plant Delights Nursery, and also at Camellia Forest uh, Nursery over in Chapel Hill. Last year, Bree was hired by Joe Lampel for his TV show, Growing a Greener, uh, Garden, a Greener World, where she is this season's landscape design and foodscaping correspondent, <laughs> filmed at her home in Garden Fugway. Uh, she promotes integrating edible plant into traditional ornamental landscape. Um, uh, Bree has been featured in Organic Gardening Magazine, and she's been identified as a leader of a new generation of uh, gardens of the 21st century. Last year, Bree, uh, Bree and her husband David were co-chairs of the Galen Garden event. Uh, Bree is here, here today to speak on the topic of Woody Winter Wonderland. <laughs> that is woody plants that bloom in the wintertime. Please welcome for you all. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. I'm really loud. I told Chris I did not need a microphone. <laughs> I made well, her. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Bobby. Uh, this is actually my first time ever speaking at the Arboretum, so it's really an honor to be here. And um, I'm native to mi from Michigan, Zone 5. I hate winter. I absolutely hate it. This week has been such a struggle for me. I feel like I'm like JC. I have chlorophyll. In order to photosynthesize, I need sunlight. This week has been a nightmare. Uh, but doing this presentation, I'm trying to sort of rev myself up for accepting that December through March happens every single year. And there are little beacons of sunshine out in the garden. Uh, so again, thank you for having me. I'm just generally a plant nerd, trying to navigate through this horticulture industry. I'm also a cat lady, and if you follow me on Facebook, you know this for sure. I post lots of pictures of kitties. Um, I've devoted most of my 15 years career in this industry to plant production, specifically uh, rare trees and shrubs. It's kind of what gets me most excited. They're the most difficult to produce, so. Um, now I have been devoting probably the last six years a lot of time and attention to designing foodscapes for the suburbs. This happens to be an area with a lot of sun and irrigation and HOAs that are telling people they're not allowed to grow food, which I think is completely absurd. So my goal is to sort of change that approach, integrate food in a beautiful ornamental fashion so that you're not making your HOAs angry and you're using your space for something more than just the aesthetic. Um, most recently, I've devoted my time and energy as a horticulture communicator. I spend way too much time trying to figure out how to get new people to embrace gardening. This is a really big challenge. Um, if you have suggestions, please let me know because the industry is sort of desperate. Um, as people become more urbanized, you know, we're looking at, well, what even is a garden? Because it's certainly not what it was even 20 years ago. So that's what I'm devoting a lot of my time and energy to trying to figure out. And as was mentioned, I've joined Growing a Greener World, which is, of course, a, a PBS program. Uh, UNC TV out of Chapel Hill is our parent station. Uh, so in addition now to raising money for the Arboretum, <laughs> donate money to PBS, it's a good cause. <laughs> and I'm happy to invite you all this year to our annual tomato tasting, which is a fundraiser for the Arboretum. Last year we raised funds for the Children's Gardening Program. This year we'll be raising money for the new edible garden that Richard Hartledge is designing, so that'll be a really exciting new addition to the landscape here. And of course, lots of people from the Arboretum come. We invite everybody. Uh, it's a great time. It's guaranteed to rain. This is a rain or shine event. But if we're in a drought, you should call me. I'll coordinate a party for you. We'll have a, a rain that will absolutely break a drought in a heartbeat. We average about four inches for this party. <laughs> so wear rubber boots. <laughs> and 
This is a, I have a really nerdy presentation that's quite long. I'm going to try to go through it fast, but I wanted to make sure that you got my social media handles if you want to follow, um, interact. It's so easy. Uh, Facebook and Instagram especially for sharing photographs and sharing information. And if you have visited Camellia Forest in the last few years, you inevitably met Cubby, who now lives in Fuquay but has quite a story. He disappeared for two months last spring and happily was returned because of his microchip. He had made it all the way to Inner Beltline Raleigh from Fuquay. And he was really quite quite in bad condition. He was down to almost six pounds. This is an enormous kitty. He's now 26 pounds. So, he is a very happy garden cat. I know, I, I am a cat lady, I told y'all. I have an obligation to let people know Cubby is doing extraordinarily well. And of course, his love of camellias is a nine. So, um, he, he is quite, quite a, a, a creature. Uh, He's now outgrown all of his cat accessories, so he wears dog harnesses. Because of course we don't trust him to go outside on his own. So my husband and I are now those people that walk a cat on a leash. <laughs> we're proud. <laughs> so going on to the presentation today, we're going to cover kind of everything that makes a plant worthy for winter interest. And so of course that includes branching berries, foliage, and then, of course, the most difficult, precarious part, flowers, which are, of course, this Zone 5 natives love. Anything that blooms in January just gets me super excited. So, winter interest branching. Of course, you have to start, Ace, Ace or Palmatum Seigukaku is such a classic. I don't think you can ever beat it for this incredible flush of bright red bark. Um, you know, it's pretty common, you see this around. When I was in Denmark this fall with International Plant Propagators, I actually saw they were using this as a coppice tree. <coughs> of course, the best interest is going to be the new growth. So if you cut this every five to eight years back pretty hard, you're going to increase its flush. It, of course, will grow more, more shrub-like than tree-like but you have a much better range of that bright red for winter interest, so it's something to consider. Now here on the left, I had the great pleasure of visiting Joanne on Sunday at the Unique Plant, and she has an absolutely spectacular tree specimen. This is definitely a tree that shows up best with a dark green backdrop, so if you're designing it in your garden, plan to put it against some Nellie Stevens or you know some other broadleaf evergreen. Uh, but it's obviously a beautiful tree uh, as well. So Acer Triflorum is a plant that I don't see in the trade, but of course you can find it mail order. And um, you know, again, zone five, I grew up with Acer Grissium. That was what we planted for exfoliating bark. Down here, it's not going to be one of your stronger growers. I actually have a Triflorum and a Grissium planted in my garden the same age, the same time. The Triflorum is more than four times the size. It has great vigor, and it exfoliates at a really young age. Uh, so I highly recommend looking into Acer Triflorum. It'll eventually grow into a nice kind of shade tree size. I have mine planted in full sun, no irrigation. This is a former tobacco field. It's all sand. It's done extraordinarily well. I think juvenility will hold on to some of the foliage, and of course this year, none of the leaves fell off before we had that stupid 19 degree dip in November. Uh, but generally, you know, it'll be leafless through the winter. Cornicericea is another plant I grew up with in Zone 5, so I have kind of a special place for it. Um, I don't love it in North Carolina, I'll tell you that. Uh, it seems to get some disease problems. I think it has some pythium issues, especially in, you know, unamended clay soils. However, when I was uh, preparing this presentation to do a green and growing last week, I wanted to include plants that were available in the wholesale trade. Panoramic Farms is growing these two beautiful cultivars, Cardinal, which is a little more orange, Arctic Fire, which is definitely more red. I think it's suitable even short term as a container plant for winter interest, even if you don't devote a lot of landscape space to it. Um, you know, it's like a shrub, Sengukaku, so you kind of can't go wrong. That bright red is just so good. <clears throat> the Harry Lauder's walking stick is one of my favorites. And my favorite story about this plant is, 
Excellent pin. Uh, Paul James, the fantastic rhododendron breeder out of Virginia, has this like 20 year old specimen and it died. And instead of cutting it down, he was like, the only reason you grow it is for, you know, it's deciduous habit anyway. So I started thinking, I should plant these all over and slowly kill them. And then I'll have these fantastic specimens all of summer. You know, because the foliage is just okay. You're growing it for this contortion. So consider that if you have one and it dies, you don't need to remove it right away. You can utilize it. Uh, get that winter interest all year. Uh, these happen to be specimens grown at Panther Creek Nursery, which is a wholesale grower south of Raleigh, uh, which leads me to believe that these specimens will be available at garden centers this spring. So, you know, if you don't have one, you should get one. And, you know, you can check Logan's or Homewood or any of your garden centers around and ask them. So Cornus Moss Spring Glow, I had actually not even thought about Cornus until I was at the Unique Plant last week and I was like, oh my gosh, look at that exfoliating bark. You know, it's to me, it has a lot of different values. It has bright yellow flowers, generally February, early March. Um, it's a beautiful kind of small shade tree dogwood, uh, but the exfoliating bark really makes it extraordinary. Joanne, how old is this specimen? Oh, it's probably 20 years old. 20 years old, okay. So it's not probably going to break records as far as how fast it grows, but it's definitely good long term in the landscape. Uh, I think it's a lot cleaner than a river birch, so there's a big advantage for growing it. Ponsiris trifoliata flying dragon was the first hardy citrus that I was ever introduced to. And of course, you know, coming to Montrose, Seeing hardy citrus, I like, was having a conniption. It's very exciting for a Midwestern transplant. Though you don't really want to eat the fruit, they don't taste good at all. They're quite pretty. Um, beautiful, kind of striated, green bark, sharp, sharp thorns. Like all citrus, you're not going to want to walk through it. Nancy actually has it planted, I believe, as a border. And we used to laugh because it was bordering an elementary school, so she was making sure that none of those students were going to cross over into the garden. <laughs> but it's extremely efficient as a border, especially, you know, maybe along uh, a roadside where you're wanting to not have trash, you know, fly into your garden places. I happen to use it as a single specimen. Uh, I'm, I'm really clumsy, and I don't want to impale myself on it. <laughs> and of course, Almost, almost, almost parvifolia is a great elm that we can grow here. The straight species on the right has, you know, this great modeling bark. And then again, this is at the Unique Plant last week. Seju has this wonderful kind of pine bark. It's really corky and uh, has great texture. Um, I imagine, you know, that it looks great plant under planted with different perennials um, or kale. <laughs> so moving into berries, uh, I do, I love berries. Berries can sometimes create some invasive problems, so I've tried to choose some plants that don't really have that issue. And one of my favorites all time is Idesia. Now this is a tree. This is not a shrub. Sometimes people describe it as a tree form Nandina. It is completely deciduous. Uh, so, you know, in the summer you have that nice kind of tropical looking bark with a nice uh, red pedestal. And the main reason you grow it, of course, is for this winter berry set. Now they're dioecious, so this is probably the main reason you don't see it more commonly in garden centers or wholesale trade. It's definitely a plant you can find mail order. Uh, you do need to have a male and female in order to get the berry set. And from a production standpoint, the females can be difficult. Uh, often people coppice the male because you don't need them to grow as a tree. They're not going to set berries. So they have great juvenile growth. You can root those pieces like there is no tomorrow. And then you try to stick cuttings of a, you know, a 50 foot female. You don't get anything to root. So often what you find, the females are grafted and the males are rooted. So you just need to make sure if you get a grafted specimen, you don't let any understock grow out. Do the birds eat the berries? Does anybody know that? I kind of don't think they do. At least they don't in the winter. I don't know exactly what happens to the berries. I know the original specimen 
that Dr. Parks brought into the U.S. There are never any seedlings growing, even though it does set berries. So I don't know what happens to the berries, but they do disappear. And so I have a big crush on Mahonia. Um, again, this is a plant I didn't grow up growing. And working at Montrose, where there were a lot of deer at that time and a lot of dry shade, this was one of the only plants that really survived that kind of condition. Um, I happened to grow Mahonia for really two reasons. For pollinators and for cut foliage. I love a good cut flower arrangement and I really love a cut foliage arrangement because they're not messy. Uh, you know, every morning I have all these Prunus mume branches in the house and there's just rings of petals on every, you know, every table in my house. Mahonia does not shed. This is a picture I took last year. Those, those leaves, those bright red leaves of that Mahonia, that's actually a Mahonia hybrid, lasted eight weeks in a vase. Nothing other than, you know, cleaning out the, the water every now and again. So it's a great use to bring a plant inside. But of course, as we're talking berries in this section, Mahonia aquifolium has these awesome blueberries that follow shortly these incredible bright yellow flowers. Uh, again, it's it's deer resistant. It's drought tolerant. It takes shade. It's you know you don't you don't want to fall on it. It is kind of sharp, but it's a great plant. Uh, the species Yuri bracteata. You're probably familiar with soft caress, which is a seed selection out of this species. Narahira is a new cultivar that Hawksridge uh, out of the mountains is actually producing. It's a little more compact than soft caress. It has that nice same soft foliage. You know, nice smaller spikes of yellow flowers followed by a blueberry set. Uh, the Mahonia urebracteata is a really nice, almost marginally hardy. When we get really cold, you might have some dieback on it, so you want to plant it in a slightly more protected zone. And my favorite, Mahonia gracilipes. I, of course, included it because it does set little blueberries, which are quite cute. But look at the backside of that leaf. It's so awesome. It's like a powder, powdery white. Uh, you know, again, nice kind of low maintenance habit. This tends to be a little shorter. Uh, the deer don't eat it, so there's a million reasons to grow it. I actually grow this in a container. When we get really cold, I shove my container, you know, either in a shed or in my greenhouse just to make sure the root zone doesn't freeze. I like Decidua Council Fire. You know, when people say, oh, I saw this tree burying holly that was deciduous, this is generally what they're talking about. Uh, multi-stem, uh, you know, nice berry set. This again is at the Unique plant last week, so this is what it looks like in real time right now. <laughs> when people talk about a cute little deciduous shrubby holly, this is what they're talking about. Verticillata, winter red, there's lots of cultivars of this. Uh, you know, you can get this in red berries, orange, yellow, all kinds of diversity, but it's a great easy maintenance, you know, growing sun, the part shade. Again, Daisha, so you do need to have a male cultivar to, uh, to accompany the female to get berry set. So moving into winter interest foliage for do conifers. When I was getting this talk prepared, I was in the midst of being an elf at Weston Farms, <laughs> the fabulous magnolia wreaths. And it's that opportunity I have to look at what ordinarily I would be sticking to make cuttings. And I go wild cutting it, knowing that there's nothing other than it looking pretty in a wreath. It's so exhilarating. <laughs> when you devote all of your time to trying to cultivate things to put roots on, I have to say it's a, a huge relief when you get to just use it for purely aesthetic purposes. So of course, I can't not mention the Camicyparis obtusa cultivars. There's a thousand out there. But they're all very easy to grow sun to part shade, you know, they grow well in even Carolina clay, very low maintenance, very few issues with them. I love them as container plants uh, because I don't have a huge amount of space to devote to a 20 by 20 gold mop, uh, but I think you can still grow it uh, and, you know, recycle it now and again. So uh, one of the first plants I've ever named is this uh, Cryptomeria. This was a branch sport that uh, we selected at Camellia Forest. And of course, this is its summer color. It's kind of a nice white flushed variegation. It's a very dense plant. 
I think it's going to be quite suitable for suburban screening, getting into that maybe 12 by 12 range rather than a Yoshino that's going to be 60 foot tall. Let's face it, we don't need 60 foot screens in the suburbs. We need human sized screens. Like for the landscapers of the world to recognize that so that we stop wasting our energy on lines of green giants. The name says it. Uh, but here it is in its winter color. Uh, it gets a nice sort of golden hue, a lot like the color of champagne. Uh, so this is last year following 11 degrees. Of course, last year we got to single digits, didn't have any trouble at all. So a native that I don't see utilized very often, uh, which wholesalers are growing, so that means garden centers do have access to these, is the Pinus palustros. Now, I understand it's maybe not the best specimen in the ground. It sends down a deep tap root. When it hits hard pan clay, it stops growing, and then it has lodging issues when we have hurricanes and things, which I think is why you don't see them more often in the Piedmont landscape versus where I'm at and then heading south. You know, you start to see them actually growing natively. But look at it in a pot. It's so cute as a container plant. And you know, it, it's easy to grow. It's an inexpensive plant to produce. There's no reason you can't grow it in a container for a little while and then discard it over time. You don't have to keep plants for a whole lifetime. We've got to keep the nursery industry in business. <laughs> so you've got to occasionally buy new plants, you know? And container gardening is a fantastic excuse to keep buying new plants. <laughs> So, of course, I can't not talk about this. Of course, you can't find it anywhere, and I lust for it. This is, again, last week uh, at Joann's. This specimen is so beautiful. The plants here are so incredible. Somebody with good grafting skills, please keep trying to get this into production so that it can be available at an ARCS sale sometime. You know, the Pinus tadias, it's an easy plant to grow. And this dwarf form is so delightful. It's not really going to be a big threat to falling on your house, like so many of the other large ones are. And one of my favorite pines that I don't see enough of, and I don't know whether it's because maybe it's cost prohibitive, because it isn't the fastest growing plant, at least to get it started, but Thunderhead, the, you know, the Japanese black pine, to me, it just calls for the winter landscape, flanking an entry or using it in containers. I've actually seen this effectively used as a hedge near the beach. It's very salt tolerant, so if you have a beach house, you can totally plant this without any trouble. Um, it's just the texture to me is so delightful. It has nice white candles uh, with, when it flushes new growth in the spring. Thuya coriensis, if you're going to grow one Thuya, this is the one, you know, arborvitaes are sort of everywhere. And they have a great use. They're a pretty low maintenance evergreen. Why aren't we seeing more of this? This is a great screening plant. You know, it's relatively slow growing, so, you know, 10 year size is like 15 by 12. Part sun to pretty dense shade. It'll be a little slower in dense shade. Again, the deer don't seem, they don't nibble on it. Now, I'll never guarantee that a deer won't rub its antlers on, especially on a conifer. Uh, but generally, you know, this is a plant that doesn't require a whole lot of effort. But that is ultimately why you want to grow it. Look at that silverback. It's the most amazing silverback conifer I have ever witnessed. Uh, of course, when I saw this, I immediately thought, wow, wouldn't that look amazing against magnolia foliage? <laughs> so be prepared in the future to have silver and brown holiday decor from Western Farms. <laughs> but again, this is a, a great conifer that right now is probably bound up in mail order. Uh, so if you ask your garden centers enough, maybe they'll convince somebody at a wholesale nursery to start getting this propagated. It's very easy to produce. Tim? Start sticking honeys. <laughs> so broadleaf evergreens, broad, to me broadleaf evergreens are what makes zone 7 so special. Uh, growing up in zone 5, boxwoods and rhododendrons were really the only broadleaf evergreens that you would see in the landscape. Uh, so down here we have a lot of options, so many options. Starting with abelia, there are a lot of abelia cultivars available. And a uh, kaleidoscope is one that kind of convinced me of the merit of an abelia, and I have yet to find <coughs> a new introduction that's superior 
to Kaleidoscope, so this is the one I always kind of go back to. Now, like all abelias, you're going to have to do some pruning because they kind of get out of hand, but that foliage color is so dynamic. You see up in the corner, that is, there it is after a hard, hard frost. Um, it's just, you know, a beautiful little beacon. I like using them as, as low-growing hedges that you just shear. And of course, in the summer, it's great for pollinators. It sets, you know, beautiful white flowers. So Choisia ternata sundance. I happen to grow this plant really well in uh, South Wake County, all sand soil. <laughs> in hard pan clay, you're going to have to do a little more work to get this to grow successfully. It's very intolerant of wet feet. Um, however, it's not intolerant of cold and snow and ice. You know, that picture was taken, I guess, gosh, already two years ago. We had a snowstorm in Chapel Hill, and it immediately bounced right back. It has no problem uh, with snow weight. Um, here it is in my garden. On the right, it's after 11 degrees. On the left is after we had a snow, but then got to single digits. And you can't totally tell, but that rosemary totally died when we got to single digits. But that Toysia has no problems whatsoever. Um, you can count on Choisia growing a little wider than tall, and of course it's a great, it, you know, it's just a great plant in general. Here it is in the spring, has nice fragrant white flowers, smell like baby powder, they're absolutely delightful. It's such a pleasant surprise. Um, for me, it's my favorite winter interest cut. It lasts eight to ten weeks in, in water in my house. It's a beautiful addition, it brightens the room, it's free because it's in my garden, and it's my way of being able to kind of manage its size. Uh, so, you know, I think there's a, a big underestimate for not pruning in the winter. You can prune them in the winter, use them uh, for winter entries inside your house, and then throw them out instead of waiting until July and filling up your compost bin. So similar to Nan or similar to Abelia, there are a million Nandina available on the market, and um, I'm not a huge lover of Nandina. I think their berries tend to lend themselves on the invasive side. Um, however, this variety, Blush Pink, has continuously caught my eye. This is a pink firepower essentially. It does not set berries. It's super dwarf. You know, I have a feeling we're going to see these grown as little soldiers in parking lots, which is not my favorite way to use an Andina. Uh, but, you know, that pink is a really dynamic color, and um, it's, it's going to be everywhere. It's, it's being promoted through the Southern Living Plant Collection, so expect to see this kind of at every garden center uh, as you go out this spring. Solar Flare, if there's one holly I can't get enough of, it's this one, which is uh, another fantastic selection from the unique plant. This is what a branch sport off of Oakland holly, so it's got that really great leaf texture with this incredible variegation. You cannot go wrong. It's just a must-have plant. If you don't have it, go to the unique plant. They have tons of them, and they're beautiful. They've been protected in the cold, uh, though it's perfectly hardy out in the landscape. And again, this is a, a favorite cut foliage for me, I think that it has so many values, not just as a single specimen. I'd love to see this actually as a hedge, because again, these tend to not grow as vigorously as your more common hollies like Nellie's or Mary Nell. So I think this is a logical plant to use for suburban screening at 12 to 15 foot height. Well, I have a huge crush on all things osmanthus. And when I was trying to figure out which osmanthus to include, because I originally started with like 25, uh, there are a lot of species osmanthus that deserve attention. But I decided to stick with heterophilus uh, because they do tend to be later blooming, so they kind of count as a flower for winter, but they have amazing foliage attributes. And this was one that was kind of new to me. It's actually planted right outside this building. Um, Tim and I were getting cuttings in the garden. I said, oh my God, what is that variegated thing? Sure enough, it's Osmanthus heterophilus hembu. And it has a smaller leaf. It's a nice kind of petite stature. 
Uh, how much maintenance do you do on it? Very little. It's Very little. So it's currently growing at, you know, maybe three and a half foot tall, maybe equally wide. It's sort of a nice foundation plant. That's actually how it's planted here is as a foundation plant. Um, one of the big advantages, of course, of Osmanthus heterophilus is the lack of attention from deer. So I'll never ever want to say if something is not going to be eaten by a deer, but it's less likely to be chomped on. So if you live in a deer infested neighborhood, start suggesting these to your neighbors. Purpureus is another cultivar that uh, has this incredible flush of purple new growth. Uh, hence its name. It also has really fragrant flowers that here in Chapel Hill or Raleigh, Chapel Hill area tend to bloom around Thanksgiving. Now in Savannah, I was there about four weeks ago, they were still in full flower. Unlike fragrance, which smells a little more on the citrusy side or more like nectarine, these have a more floral scent, which can be a little overwhelming if they're planted in mass. So maybe don't plant these the same way you would an Osmanthus fragrance just for that reason. Uh, but I think one of each is actually a very good idea. Just look at the color, it's amazing. What else gives you that dark purple new growth you know, that the deer don't eat? So sasaba is one that I love because of its incredible texture. And it's really sharp, so the deer really don't like to nibble on this. Um, it's again a good size for screening. One of my, I've lived in the suburbs ever since I've owned a house and I've always been challenged with, well, Leyland hedges that die and cost a fortune to take out and what do you replace them with? So a lot of my focus on broadleaf evergreens is for the screening purpose. These aren't necessarily plants that you need to use as a foundation if you're trying to hide your neighbor's swing set, you know, or your neighbor's unsightly car. Um, so this is a plant that I highly suggest for that. It has, you know, a pretty good vigorous habit, and the texture is just amazing. Goshiki, you know, an oldie but a goodie. We can thank Barry Inger for bringing this plant in. There are few plants that even compete for the color that Goshiki osmanthus can provide. Um, though I think Goshiki translates to five colors. I generally see white, pink, green, and yellow. I'm not sure if maybe there's like a muddled color that gets counted as the fifth. Uh, but you know, this tends to be relatively slow growing, so it's easily used as a container plant or you know, flanking a doorway. Wholesale growers love this plant and they grow it in abundance. They plant them and they grow them and shear them as round balls and as beautiful spears. And I've even seen them topiary here in Wake County. Uh, so there's a lot of different applications that you can use Goshiki in. Um, you're just never going to be disappointed with this plant, so. Do any of these get berries? You know, I've never noticed, yeah, I guess, I've noticed them on purpureas. They're tiny. You're not definitely not growing them for their berry set. But where there's flowers, there should be fruit if they're pollinated. So, yeah. Yeah. Do they grow in shade? Yes. They will grow in sun, I'm going to say to part shade. They'll probably live in dense shade. They just won't grow as vigorously or they won't be as dense for screening purposes. Uh, but, you know, at, at Camellia Forest, we grew everything in shade and they did just fine. Uh, yeah. What is their cold hardiness? Zone 6, generally. 7, 6. Everything that I'm showing you, Camellia Forest list is zone 6. So that's 10 degrees colder than what we average here. So pretty reliable. I've yet to have any of my Osmanthus go deciduous, unless they got like summer stress from top watering, <laughs> which does happen in my unirrigated sandy soil. <laughs> so Jim Porter is a really interesting hybrid, and you can see the texture on this is just to die for. The Arboretum has a really fantastic specimen here, which has provided me with thousands of cuttings. Um, you know, this bloomed in my house for the first time late fall. I think it was right around Thanksgiving that it was blooming. And again, it's not that fragrance, it's not the fragrance scent. It's a little more floral, but it's quite delightful. 
like fragrance, the flowers are not showy. You're not really even going to notice them. They're just tiny little white things along the branches, which is perhaps why we don't really notice the fruit set, because it's also small and kind of hidden behind the foliage. So trachycarpus, similar to hardy citrus, is like super amazing to me because you can grow a palm tree. Oh my goodness, how can you not grow a palm tree? Um, of course, th this is a native, it's a trunk form. Um, it grows well in sun. I think actually you can grow it in quite dense shade. Um, this picture is actually down in North Augusta. I loved that she's growing it with a literally a, a glass mulch, which if you've been to my garden, you know I love glass. Uh, and then agaves as a, as a base for it. Here it is last winter, actually last winter on this weekend, which I think is when Kelly was speaking, we had that horrible snowstorm. And um, I was super depressed because it looked way too much like Michigan. But <laughs> totally, totally survived just fine. Um, here it is, you know, rebounding in the spring. You can, you can see a fat cat in the shop there. Um, I planted mine a little too close to my house because <laughs> I was afraid that they weren't going to be hardy. So I thought they needed to have that extra protection. Now, I don't know what I'm going to do. They're getting quite tall. Over the summer, it's actually reached the eve. Um, so I guess maybe I'm at the stage where I either have to dig it up or plan to prune it so that it goes over my roof line. Uh, don't always do what I do. Uh, I'm a propagator. I way over plant things with the intention that I'm going to cut them back and stick the cuttings, which I do. Uh, but this was not one of my best executed plants, planting a trade purpose that close to my house. Yeah. How tall do you think it will grow? Oh gosh, what? 45, 50 feet, you know, at least. It's, they get enormous. Uh, actually here, <laughs> this is the original specimen at the original Camellia Forest location where Dr. Parks lives. And uh, this looks crazy popping out of a pine forest. <laughs> it's like, whoa, what's going on there? It literally is, I would say, every bit 45 feet tall. It's pretty spectacular. It's so tropical. But so a different species, trachycarpus, that I haven't seen in the trade, but it's literally right outside that doorway. So when you leave today, take note. It is such a cool plant. Trachycarpus wagnerianus. It's sturdier, and the branches aren't, or the, the leaves aren't floppy. Um, <laughs> Tim pointed out it tends to have a slightly incurved trunk. It has great tolerance for wet, cold, which we experience every winter. Um, and I think you're estimating, what, 15 by 10? It might get bigger than that. Um, has it flowered or set seed? I don't think that one's flowered yet. OK, well, stay tuned, because I'll, I will make sure that Tim gets that propagated. <laughs> it's an aw it really is an awesome specimen, and it's just outside. So when you leave today, make sure you take a look. How do you propagate it, like one of those? You know, you, you grow it from seed. You don't really asexually produce palms. Yeah, they don't, they don't root. <laughs> uh, and so one of my favorite edibles, I did not uh, do this talk, you know, to focus on edibles, but this Vaccinium Rosa's blush, which was developed here at NC State, at first it didn't have a lot of traction. You know, it's not great for berry set, no ornamental value, but I hadn't seen it grown. Uh, now wholesalers have picked it up. And they're growing it really, really well. When I grew it, it was kind of leggy and floppy because I wasn't cutting it enough. And maybe I wasn't giving it quite enough fertilizer. These wholesale guys have figured out how to grow this plant spectacularly. They're growing it nice mounds. I totally see this being applied, you know, for a low-growing hedge. Um, this is, I took these pictures. This is just looking into the sun. This is the sun's behind me. Uh, this was the second week of December outside, unprotected, in Wake County. So it is pretty much reliably evergreen. It manages to hold on to this nice sort of pinky purple growth throughout the winter. And this is a little deceptive. It's really not red. It, it has this sort of bluish gray cast that contrasts that pink really well. Who's growing that, Brick? Panther Creek uh -huh. and Hawks Ridge. Okay. Yes. 
And these are uh, fantastic three gallon specimens that I feel quite certain that Logan's is going to have beautiful lines of these come spring shopping season. And if they don't, ask them for it because they are available and that, that's really the key. There are some great plants that garden centers never pick up on because the customers aren't asking and so there has to be you know, a good communication between the customer and whomever your plant supplier is. Having devoted most of my time to mail order, I had the luxury of being able to hear one customer at a time and take their advice, to grow the plants they were requesting. I know garden centers want to do the same, they just don't often have those discussions with the people. So an oldie but a goodie, I love yucca, I love them, I'll never get tired of them. When I see them used as annuals in neighborhood entries with stupid pansies that are covered in netting, it drives me crazy. Why don't they just fill the whole island with these? You know, they're low maintenance, they're spectacular, they're color year round. Um, I wish that I could do a mass planting like this. I would definitely impale myself because I have no grace whatsoever. Uh, but, you know, to me, a mass planting of this yucca is just absolutely to die for. Uh, low maintenance. I like to cut uh, some of the foliage off and use them again. It's winter interest foliage arrangements in the house. They're super clean. They don't shed anything. They last a really long time in water. All right, so moving into my favorite category, the flowers. Let's we'll start with winter sweet, um, which of course, for me, bloomed this like the second week of December. It was really early this year. Um, there are some challenges with winter sweet. They do not root. <laughs> I have probably in my lifetime stuck 25,000 cuttings, and I don't think I've gotten a single plant to actually put roots on. And that's super frustrating when that is your only mission in life, you know, is to put roots on, on cuttings. So you often see them seed grown or grafted. And so what Camellia Forest has traditionally sold are seed grown. They've often not flowered, so you don't know what color you're going to actually get. Sometimes they're kind of, this is the plant in my garden, which was seed grown. And it's, I mean, it's actually a very pretty color. It's a pale yellow with a nice red throat. Of course, these are luteus, and so these do have to be asexually produced to guarantee this. So you'll see these grafted on seed stock. Uh, the key here, again, make sure the understock doesn't grow out, or the energy will be zapped from the plant you want, and you'll have the seedling growing, which isn't all that. Of course, they're super fragrant. Uh, they're really, really, really vigorous. I think I had six feet of growth this, this summer. So um, don't plant it where you're trying to manage it two by two. That's just not a wise idea. Give it the appropriate amount of space, cut it when it flowers, and enjoy it for what it is, a large deciduous shrub. Yeah? Here. Anybody know? I don't know. I haven't bothered no. ours. Haven't? <coughs> We're going to count that on the not favored by deer size. It's close to it's related to blue or meat. Uh, it is a rough leaf. Sure, it's a rough leaf. So it's, it tends to be pretty safe. Okay. Well, there we have it. it, has it. So Coralopsis is one of my all-time favorite deciduous flowering shrubs. It's a little late. Uh, they tend to start blooming, depending on the temperatures, late February into March. Um, and Coralopsis passiflora is kind of a medium-sized species. There's actually a lot of species. I cover three. Uh, Cow on an 8 by 8 size range. It has a pretty vigorous growth habit, so it's not going to take very long to get into that size. But, you know, these sort of buttercup yellow flowers are just so beautiful. They're generally three weeks before forsythia, and they're about 20 shades easier on the eyes than forsythia. You know, forsythia sort of screams out, this is kind of telling you spring is almost here and I'm sweet. Mm -hmm. uh, moist, well-drained soil. I've seen some people have issues with this with root rot. So if it's not, you know, amended clay, you might, in a really wet season, have some dieback or unfortunately lose the plant altogether. Uh, from my experience, I have not heard a lot of reports of deer issues on this plant as well. So that's another big reason to include it. 
Uh, Coralopsis sinensis is going to be a larger growing species compared to Passiflora. I like to give 10 year sizes, so don't think 40 years from now, 12 by 12 is going to just stop. Plants don't stop growing. My, my size estimates do tend to be a 10 year size. I think that's when gardeners start kind of re-looking at their landscape, making some decisions on whether they want to cut something down or pull something out. So 12 by 12 is definitely taking up more real estate. Um, has really large dangling flower clusters. Um, same kind of conditions, all of these are going to be best in part sun to shade uh, and good drainage. You know, I've seen these grown really well with, you know, kind of some steep slopes. Uh, they don't require a tremendous amount of water to do well. And this is a real, I think this is a real gem. March Jewel was introduced by Dr. Parks. Um, this happens to be the hardiest that anybody seems to have recorded. Barry Hinger, who grows in real zone 6A, central Pennsylvania, has grown this for, I think, 20 years, has never had any problems growing it. And this tends to be more low but quite wide, so it's going to be more broad spreading. I think it's a great option for growing, you know, over a wall or, you know, hanging over waterfall, <laughs> if you have such a thing. Um, I use these again as forced branches. I have every species in my house right now, they're just starting to get ready to open inside. They were cut last week. Uh, so it's another great way of bringing the winter garden in when it's miserable and raining and you don't want to go outside and see your coralopsis. You can sit in your kitchen and enjoy it. <laughs> And of course, here is a, a close-up on that flower. It's just beautiful. It kind of reminds me of hops. So Edgeworthia, I think everybody is familiar with Edgeworthia, right? Okay. Well, it's a must-have plant, which again is a great forced cut. I have them in full flower inside my house right now. And it's super fragrant, and it makes me want to sit on my couch all day long. Um, so snow cream is definitely the variety that you see the most of. This was introduced by Tony at Plant Delights. And um, it's definitely the most vigorous of the cultivars that I've seen in the trade. Um, sun to part shade. If you grow it in sun, they tend to be uh, with shorter inner nodes and maybe more flowering. Uh, whereas in deep shade, they tend to have a more open habit. Um, they like moist but well drained, and that's a really critical point. They don't like sitting in saturated soil. They they actually do have some root rot issues. So um, you know, don't plant in an area where all your gutter runoff is going to go and sit for a week. Here it is in the summer. You know, beautiful tropical foliage. Uh, the lore on this plant, the reason it's called paper bush, it was the foliage was used in the 15th century in China to print their highest denominations of money. So that's actually where the name originates, the common name originates. And here's the specimen at the Unique Plant last week. I think we said this is, what, seven, eight years old? Uh, so, you know, it's certainly wider than tall, but it's taking up a fair amount of real estate. Yeah? Uh, are there smaller cultivars? Yeah. Well, I guess there Thank are. You. <laughs> Thank you for leading me into my slide. <laughs> so this is a very informal little experiment that I did. I, I propagated all three of these cultivars the same week. I grew them all in identical conditions, all next to one another in the greenhouse. They all had the same amount of fertilizer, exact same soil. And this is what I noticed. Snow cream is a beast. It's a fabulous plant. It's got great vigor. It is not necessarily the right choice for a small space. These, uh, you know, were these are one and a half year old from rooted cutting. I like to stick three inch cuttings to give you an idea of what they started with. So Gold Rush seems to be a good intermediate grower. Um, this variety from Hawksridge, which I happened upon when I bought their booth at Green and Growing in 2006, is half the size of Gold Rush, three quarters the size of Snow Cream. So if you're wanting to grow this near your front door so that you can enjoy the fragrance every time you walk in and out, this is totally the cultivar to choose unless you have an enormous foundation space. This is also a great option for a container, the smaller one. 
Of course, they'll all grow in containers. They're just more difficult to keep water the larger they are. So I wouldn't recommend snow cream long term in a pot. Do you have to keep it inside the litter? No, not at all. If it's in a pot. I have not. My, I have one in a container, and it hasn't even gotten the greenhouse treatment when we got to 12 degrees last week. So yeah, I think they're actually perfectly hardy. Maybe single digits or sustained freezing. You might not want the root zone to freeze. Uh, but I think for general Carolina conditions, you're, you're pretty safe. And of course, these are all grown in pots in the nursery trade, and they don't go to great measures to shield these plants from you know, extreme cold. So that's another consideration. So Pernas Mume, because I, you know, I've, been, I've worked at Camellia Forest for five years, became very quickly addicted to Pernas Mume. We were one of the only sources for a, a wide variety. The reason is they're a nightmare to propagate. I'll just tell you that. There's, they're never going to be a maple. You're never going to see them you know, in the commercial landscape the way I wish that we could, simply because they are not the easiest thing to get roots on. Um, but so they're flowering apricots, they are native to Japan, and they are the earliest of the flowering fruit trees. Generally, if you're seeing a tree in full flower now, you're probably looking at Pernas Mume. They are fantastic cuts. They force really easily. I generally have these, I start forcing in early December. I have them through the whole holidays, well into February. Uh, they're sweet and fragrant. They are messy because they are petals but they're so worth it. Um, the darker varieties tend to have a more cinnamon type of fragrance. The paler varieties are more floral. They're all wonderful. They all do have the ability to set fruit. At Camellia Forest, we had kind of a split between people that grew them exclusively for their full or for their flowering attribute and people that wanted to pickle or ferment the fruit. And they don't care what the flowers look like. If you're wanting to grow them for their fruit, you need to choose a later blooming variety simply because the early blooming varieties tend to get zapped and the fruit set dies. They all have the ability to set fruit, so it's going to be very weather dependent. If you don't want them to set fruit, get an early blooming variety because if you've seen one of these go to fruit, you'll have tens of thousands of seedlings underneath that you then have to deal with. So a word to the wise. So Hokai Bungo is absolutely the most popular, hands down, the most popular Primus Mume. It's the darkest, it's the earliest, it's super fragrant, um, it has good vigor. Uh, when I say good vigor, that means that it actually has some propagatability. If you have a, an old tree that's growing four inches a year, you're not likely to get that rooted, but if you have a young, vigorous plant, you know, that has six to eight foot of new growth each season, you're likely going to be able to get that propagated. Again, I look at plants' value often from whether or not I can get them rooted, because <laughs> I'm a propagator. Yes? What would be the best time to take a cutting to try to root it? Uh, softwood. So late, late April, early May. You have a very short window, and that, of course, is going to depend on the kind of spring that we have, but you definitely want to stick softwood won't have a lot of success with any other type of wood on it. And of course here it is in kind of full flower. Last year this bloomed on the 10th of December. So some assorted varieties. Kobai is a really beautiful semi-double pink. Eusterio Cherimin is a nice single soft pink. Toji Bai is an absolutely spectacular single white. It, it, you know, it has that blush on the buds, but then it opens to pure white, which is really beautiful. And Nicholas is one of my favorites. This is one of Tom Kernitsky's um, selections made out of Chapel Hill, made for his son. It's an absolutely spectacular, fully double soft pink flower. Tom's selections, I highly recommend. They've got great vigor, meaning they are propagatable. They've been selected for disease resistance. Um, and, I, you know, he just has a really keen eye for making great selections on plants. And where do you get this, this Nicholas? Well, Nicholas is definitely at uh, Camellia Forest. And I don't know if you Google it. I, I, you know, it's hard to know where some of these plants are. 
Josephine is another one of Tom's selections named for his daughter. And this is here at the Arboretum. And, um, you know, it's just a beautiful single soft pink, sometimes on the white side. I think some of the coloration, it looks a little deeper pink when we're warmer. And here it is last year, full flower, 14 degrees. And look at it. There's no damage whatsoever to that flower set. Um, did it set fruit? Uh, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad somebody came into them. <laughs> So mokul, if you are looking to, uh, often I think it's an Asian tradition, a Japanese tradition to ferment the fruit and they make a very tasty liqueur. Uh, often people from China will pickle the fruit with celery and carrots and, and eat it that way. So this is generally the variety I recommend to them. It tends to be a mid to late bloomer and it's a heavy flowering form. And one of the unique attributes most prunus mumes will do this, but this is a great example. So it does a first flush of flowers on the older growth, and then you see all this new growth? That blooms like three weeks later. So you get almost two seasons of flowering out of it. Uh, and I think that's probably why this is such a reliable fruiter, because if these all freeze off, you still have you know that whole canopy to rely on. So some more Rosemary Clark and Peggy Clark are two that you do see more common in the landscape. These were bred in the 40s by this man, W.B. Clark. That is his namesake, and unfortunately this specimen died. This was in the winter garden, and it's a beautiful soft pink weeping form. I don't know of any other specimens in central North Carolina, so I have not been propagating this variety. Uh, but the whole Clark series are, are beautiful and reliable bloomers. Pink Panther is a beautiful uh, kind of medium pink semi-double that was selected by Dr. Parks for its black knot disease resistant. Uh, if you have native cherries in your woods, you have some black knot pressure, and all prunus can be very susceptible to that. So this is a big advantage to have some disease resistant genetically kind of selected in his. And oh boy, no mama, this is right outside this building, if that picture looks familiar. This is a really interesting variety. A lot of times people see it and they think it's grafted. It's not. This is a chimeric trait. So it's, um, you know, it's an unstable genetic. So sometimes it has white branches and pink branches. And those branches change from year to year. You can't necessarily always guarantee that this branch will be white consistently. Kind of as a jumping gene. So it's a really interesting variety. This is an old, old Japanese cultivar. And some more, again, Yushirio Chiraman is one of my favorite soft pinks. Mike's White is a really beautiful single white with green calyxes. So it looks really different, whereas all the other Prusumates kind of have a pink blush to them. This one absolutely does not. That's named for Tom's cousin. Uh, Bonita is a nice... Uh, again, a fruit, a good fruit setting form that's kind of a semi-double pink. And Contorta, which does have a kind of a soft pink single flower, but you're definitely growing it for that great contortion. And Matsubura Red, this is probably the second most popular. It's definitely more pink than Hokai Bungo if you were to match them together, but it has that same real cinnamony fragrance. Uh, it looked like mine was going to bloom about a week and a half ago, and then we got really cold. It's just kind of stopped. But the branches that I brought into my house are in full flower. Um, here it is last year. And Bridal Veil. So Bridal Veil is another weeping form, and this was brought into the U.S. by Dr. Parks. And here it is planted right behind you. So do a little perimeter stroll <laughs> after the show. Um, you know, it's a, a really nice soft pink on all Prunus Mume. They don't grow beautiful without help. So prune them. Prune them now so you can enjoy the branches. But here's a great example. This is unpruned, and here it is after Tim got his pruners on it. You know, not only the weeping forms, even the upright forms look better with some maintenance. So I highly recommend, you know, being diligent cut it back, at least to some degree, give it some architectural value. Otherwise, they can be very misshapen, put it that way.
And what time of year? Well, I like to prune them now because I like <laughs> to bring the foliage in, or I like to bring the branches in and enjoy the flowers. You, you can prune them any time. They won't you were going to severely hardly do it, you know, like like cut it to the ground. Well, not quite, but, but a I hard have one that's really straight. I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think you could do it any time. Maybe late March, so that you're going to capture it right when it starts to flush out. It's harder to do in the summer, but if you do it in the summer, you won't get suckery growth. Okay, so there's a good, there's a very good tip. Okay. But a lot of your rosaceous fruit trees will do it. If you do it if you prune in the summer, you won't get the suckery growth that you get <coughs> otherwise. And mm. so there's a very good suggestion. All right, so how are we on time? Correct. Okay, awesome. All right, so camellias, I have the whole second half of this is camellias. All right, so winter blooming camellias. We're not talking sasanquas, we're not talking tea. We're talking japonicas that are blooming in the cold time of year. So we have to go over some culture because these are not the easiest thing to achieve in zone seven. If we were in zone nine, oh my, it would be a very different story. Uh, so when we're trying to establish camellias, high pine shade is definitely the ideal condition. Um, and this provides a couple of different things. Winter shade, which they desperately need, and winter wind protection because you're looking at sensitive little flower buds that if you have a 12 degree wind, they're likely gonna dehydrate and fall off. Um, camellias need bright, indirect summer sun in order to set good flowers. So we're gonna keep coming back to that. The number one reason camellias die in Central North Carolina is because they're planted below grade and their roots are wet. They have no tolerance for wet feet. I more often than not would see this be the cause of plant death. People would come with these very sickly branches. What happened to my camellia? It was too wet. So the recommendation absolutely is to plant slightly above grade, compensate with mulch, amend the clay soil. Ground pine bark is your absolute friend. I, everything tree and shrub wise that you grow in North Carolina will appreciate ground pine bark. So, you know, if I could, if I could buy it, by the 30 yards at a time, I totally would. Um, again, moist, well-drained, acidic soil is what camellias need. You're trying to emulate what they're native to. And generally, camellias in Asia grow on, with some sort of elevation. Here, you know, we don't have a lot of topography to deal with. And if you have soggy, saturated soil, it's really kind of a recipe for not being super successful. So for those of us like me who live in a full sun suburban setting, what do you do? I want to grow camellias. Um, you plant them. This is, this is advice that David Parks always gave on the north side of a south facing border. Okay, so can you visualize with me that when the sun is low in the sky in the winter, the north side of a south facing border is full shade, right? All day long. When the sun is high in the sky in the summer, you're gonna get at least some direct exposure, ideally morning to midday, not late day sun. So the north side of a south facing border, that counts for tree borders and house borders and fence borders. So pretty much you can grow camellias successfully with that sort of sun orientation. Then you will have enough sunlight to set good flower buds so that you have a lot to look at the next season. The main reason people's camellias stop producing lots of flowers is because their garden has become too shady in the summer, which is a perfectly logical thing. You know, your trees grow, your garden gets bigger, and then people think there's a magic fertilizer to stimulate flower growth. That's actually not at all how it works. Camellia flowers are almost exclusively developed from morning to mid-afternoon summer sun. So, I hope that helps. Of course, I have mine planted on the north side of my house, and last year it froze for like a week straight. Mm. It was so cold. The one plant that did not drop all of its flower buds in my garden last year was planted adjacent to my dryer vent. <laughs> and so I think it's a really, really helpful thing to realize the attributes of, you know, little microclimates in your garden. I asked my husband,
than if we couldn't put dryer vents around the whole house. <laughs> I, desp I desperately want to pretend I live in zone 9, so I'm constantly growing plants that aren't really hardy. And of course, Cubby wants you to grow your camellia successfully so that you can have flowers on Valentine's Day. So, when we get really cold and you've just planted your camellias, because you know, we do generally recommend planting camellias in the fall, and then you have the chore of actually keeping them alive through the winter if we have an extreme winter. You know, caging them with some burlap definitely helps with wind. Uh, I've actually put tomato cages over small uh, camellia plants and then filled them up with ground oak leaves or, you know, uh, pine straw, anything to help give them protection, especially if you're planting something that's really small, like what we would sell at Camellia Forest. You know, a, a two-quart plant is going to have a much harder time getting through a, a cold winter uh, than, you know, an eight-year-old specimen that's in the ground. So these are tips really for getting new plants established. And of course, if you've grown a Camellia, you have seen this, and it's awful. It's the main problem that we have with Camellias, it's scale. And it's actually really pretty easy to manage. Um, applying oil isn't that labor intensive. You want to make sure you do coat the underside of the leaves so you just kind of want to get your wand up in the plant and just cover it. Um, ideal temperature range for oil application is going to be 50 to 70. So that's why I recommend doing it in autumn and spring. You don't really want to apply oil in the extremes of cold or heat because the foliage can be damaged. Um, I definitely am not going to recommend anybody use any more neonicotinoids. That in the past has been a very effective way to control scale, but I don't think that it's responsible. So, you know, consider that when you're at the garden center buying chemicals, neonicotinoids are definitely proving to be more dangerous than not. Um, and I don't see any reason why you can't grow your camellias organically. They are not heavy feeders. You don't need to give them a synthetic 10-10-10. You can simply apply plant tone or holly tone. I do this twice a season to everything in my landscape. Just a handful at the base of the plant and it seems to work, you know, more than adequately. So of course, traditionally, camellias in the north were grown in conservatories. And there's a great reason for it, because they will flower like that, which you almost never ever see in a North Carolina landscape because we are a little too cold. Um, they don't like to be houseplants, so don't even consider it. They're horrible houseplants. They hate dry heat. They get lots of insect problems. They need coolness. They are ideal in the winter at around you know 40 to 45 degrees. Uh, so you know if you're Giving, say, a camellia to somebody in zone five, don't give them the idea that they can grow it as a house plant. They really aren't going to be super successful. Now, I like to grow some of my winter blooming varieties in containers. This is Vernalis Egao Corkscrew. Of course, it's a great container plant because it's got this great contortion. It consistently blooms the last week of December through January, and we're always super cold then. So last week, I threw it into my greenhouse. I don't have a sophisticated greenhouse. Um, I have a heat lamp and like a patio heater that keeps my greenhouse about 10 degrees warmer than it is outside. So last week it was about 22. Yeah. Are there any communities that can live in colder zones like five? Or no zone five. No. Only the zone six? There are a zone six. That's a whole different talk. Oh, okay. uh, but yes. Okay. And in zone six, you're definitely not wanting to grow winter bloomers. You're looking at fall or late spring. Um, we're really kind of pushing the limits here in zone seven, you know, for real winter blooming camellias, especially when you compare us to, say, Charleston or Savannah or New Orleans, where you see them in abundance. Uh, but I was really pleased when I finally pried my door open to see that it's in full flower. There must be 50 flowers on this, you know, container plant. It's absolutely spectacular. So I'm currently enjoying it in my greenhouse. What was the name of that? This is Igawa Corkscrew. Is it on here? Oh, you know, I don't think I included cultural slides. So that's E-G-A, yeah, E-G-A-O Corkscrew. And so a little bit about the history of camellias. Uh, they were brought in to the West, which at that time was Europe, in the late 1600s. And 
The main reason they were bringing camellias in was not for the aesthetic. They were trying to get tea plantations established. And if you've never heard this story, it's actually really kind of clever. The Chinese did not want to lose this resource. They recognized that tea was going to be a very power powerful in the, in the trade of the New World. They shipped tens of thousands of camellia japonica seeds <laughs> to Europe and ultimately to uh, the Americas where they thought they were you know, planting tea plantations. They ended up with all of these ornamental camellias that have no edible value at all. But that is ultimately what started the camellia craze through the Renaissance. Um, and so we can thank Judge Solomon out of Savannah, that's the, the short man here, who started the American Camellia Society. And you know, has done, he and many people of his era did a great job of breeding and taking great notes and making sure the camellia had a, a real place in the new world. So the camellia that got me addicted, especially to heritage, heritage camellias, was Roma Resorta. Uh, this is a plant that was imported to the U.S. in the post-Civil War time, 1866, through Magnolia Plantation. The original plant is still in the garden, and it's what I still get cuttings off of. So that's pretty fantastic. You know, I mean, talk about long-lived, pretty low-maintenance sort of specimen. And that candy striping formal double, people go completely insane. I've seen people lose their minds at Camellia Forest when they see this in bloom. <laughs> um, of course, Reverend John Brayton is who we have to thank for uh, creating the Camellia Collection at Magnolia Plantation. And uh, this is his namesake, Camellia. And the two guys that now kind of manage the space, Tom Johnson's the director, Miles Beach is in charge of their Camellia collection. If you haven't been, I highly recommend visiting. They have a wonderful collection. They've kept really good records, which is so important. Another great heritage Camellia is Governor Mouton. Uh, this, you know, you see pretty commonly. This is a viral-induced variegation, which is very popular, especially with people that are growing Camellias for flower show exhibits is you can have a solid flower and then a variegated flower. It's actually two different categories. So this virus doesn't do any damage to the plant. It often manifests as like large yellow splotches on the leaves. But its main function is to have this tie-dye coloration on the, on the flowers. And just a side note, Governor Mouton was the final signature to make the South secede, to start the Civil War. He was the governor of Louisiana. So Aunt Jetty is actually the original Governor Mouton. This is the non-virus non form. And this is a very old variety introduced in the early 1800s. And again, Governor Mouton and Aunt Jetty have the big advantage of being hardy to zone 6B. Um, it's a wonderful anemone form flower. This always blooms in January. It gets frosted, new buds open. And it does that cycle over and over again. It tends to stop blooming around the first part of March. But it's a great, reliable flower for real winter. Another one of my favorite reds is Royal Velvet. This is a large semi-double. It's great for pollinators because you've got lots of uh, stamens available. Tom Nudson is a beautiful formal double red. It has a nice compact habit. You could actually grow this in a slightly <coughs> smaller space. So striped camellias are kind of an oddity. Um, again, they're not genetically stable. So it's perfectly normal to have a striped camellia and you have a solid red flower and a solid white flower and you might have flowers that are only halfway striped. Embrace it, call it a twofer. Enjoy it for what it is. You're not really going to get them to be more stabilized. Law peppermint, Louisiana peppermint, I used to think that was an old French variety, but it's not, um, is one of the more popular. It's you know a beautiful formal double. It really looks like peppermint candy. And I love tricolor pink and destiny. I, you know, I, I have a thing for these big showy uh, romantic style flowers. They're also great for pollinators. And April Dawn, this is a great example of showing what happens with a striped camellia. Um, April Dawn is one selected by Dr. Parks after the big infamous 80s freeze. The April series arose as being one of the only party collections for Zone 6. 
And April Dawn is the only striped variety in the April series. So obviously it's a beautiful formal double, and it frequently will sport all three of these flowers at one time. Now on this <coughs> case, the solid red version has been segregated and stabilized, and that is what we call Stellar Sunrise, which is another you know, really beautiful, just for that incredible quilted flower form. So white-edged camellias, I think, are just the most interesting, and they are stable. Um, Tamano Oro was discovered in the late 70s in Japan by a logger. In all of Asia, camellias are, you know, chopped down for fuel. They, you know, they grow natively in their woods. Happily, this man recognized that the flower on this plant was unique, got nursery people involved, got it propagated, and then Nuccio's Nursery out of Southern California grew out a whole bunch of seedlings and made these incredible selections. So there's a whole Tama series, all of which are embellished with this nice white edge. Each flower, each, each cultivar has a slightly different flower form, a slightly different ultimate size. So this is when doing some research on the camellia cultivar is really critical. So you have varieties in here that might grow as big as 15 by 12, and then you have others. Uh, like Tama Peacock, which doesn't have as much vigor. You can easily manage that more 6x4. So there's lots of different sizes, and, and often those sizes are going to be cultivar specific. So I don't recommend growing Camellia Japonica with the intention of shearing it heavily. They have a beautiful natural form. Pick the variety that's appropriate for the space you're trying to fill, and don't try to make it something that it isn't. Of course, that's just good advice for all plants. Mm -hmm. um, so moving into white, April Snow again selected for its hardiness. The whites tend to show the most winter damage. So this has a great advantage in that it is a little later. Often in Chapel Hill, this would be blooming the last week of March into April. Um, this one happens to have a very wide spreading habit. It's wider than tall. If you grow that right against the house with an overhang, it doesn't mess the flowers up. Oh, good advice. And it doesn't grow so tall to cover your windows. <laughs> so White Mermaid is a beautiful single pink. The real reason to grow this is for this sort of strange leaf adaption that looks like a fishtail. And Margie and Seafoam are two just to die for formal doubles. Uh, they do tend to be mid to late season, so some of the early flowers might get damaged, but you generally will have these blooming after the threat of hard frost. And there are a lot of pink camellias available. And there are none better than Jack's. Jack's, you'll see at every garden center. It's one of the best compact forms. You can easily manage this at six by four, which is really small for a camellia. Um, and obviously, it has incredible formal double flowers. It's super floriferous that any moment when it's in full bloom, you can almost not see its foliage. It's so heavily budded. Well, Muccio's Cameo is the camellia that convinced me that there weren't too many cultivars. When I first went to work at Camellia Forest, I told David that camellias were like hostas and there were too many cultivars. <laughs> and, then, and then they started to bloom and I was like, oh, I was wrong. And then Muccio's Cameo started to bloom and I was like, oh my god, I can't live a happy life without this plant. It's spectacular. And then comes along irrigation. A branch sport all of Nusha's cameo was discovered in Kerguelen, France, hence its name, and now it is being mass produced by CAM2, so hopefully you'll see this at garden centers in 2016. So you combine the fabulous formal level pink flower with foliage that looks great all year long, it's like a to-die-for plant. And uh, April Rose, this is a really practical plant. Uh, it is hardy to zone 6A, which is really extremely cold for a camellia. And it's a great formal double. It's crazy floriferous. And it is late, so you often see this blooming. We actually had these blooming two years ago on Memorial Day, which is like two months later than normal. Um, if you haven't grown April Rose, get it. You won't be disappointed by it. It's, you know, it's just a really altogether... Nice, dark, glossy green foliage, dense habit, 
heavy flowering form, you, you can't go wrong. So October Affair is another really beautiful soft pink, but it's these incurved petals that are just spectacular. This will bloom sporadically starting in October all the way till March. I have one in flower today. Frankie Wynn is a beautiful like dessert plate sized flower. It's just amazing. If you want to enter at the Camellia Show, enter this one, you'll win. You'll win something. Um, just beautiful, again, a sporadic bloomer. So it'll start blooming in the mild fall and then continue with mild days all winter long. And Pink Perfection, the name is completely appropriate. In Japanese, all of the formal doubles were, were called Atomi. So really, this plant's name is Atomi, Atoma Rosa. Um, here I am having an absolute conniption fit. I love old camellias, and I love zone nine, and you combine them, and I can't dig straight. Uh, this is the original specimen to the United States of pink perfection. And you can see in zone nine, they grow really a lot like Japanese maple or crepe myrtle, multi-stem tree form. Here we're a little too cold. Every 20 years, they get nipped back hard. Um, but there are a lot of different variants of pink perfection in the trade so I was really excited to get the original pink perfection into production so I know for sure that it's legitimately the right plan. Uh, I think only historical enthusiasts care but I happen to be one of them. And so there's always new varieties of camellias being introduced. The world of camellias is, is going to change in a big big way as breeding focuses more on landscape value rather than uh, flower show value. Um, I'm really excited to show a plant that's been named for me. This is a Yume seedling that has you know, a really floriferous habit, nice kind of rounded form. And this here is a beautiful formal double candy stripe from my friend Lindsay. Uh, so, you know, hopefully in the coming years these plants will be out in the trade and, you know, you can start growing new camellias and you can say, I know, I know who that's named for. <laughs> So again, my social media contact, please keep in touch. And thank you so much for your time and attention. Do you have questions? Can you put that back on? Oh. We'll get back on. Yeah, okay, I'll really take a second. <laughs> yes. March Jewel. I've seen it in the Arboretum, but I haven't been able to. March Jewel. Camellia Forest definitely has it? Yeah. December and March are when the camellias are blooming. Um, Any time is a good idea <laughs> to visit Savannah or Charleston. But for camellias, definitely, when I was there the second week of December, there were a ton of camellias in full flower. They had an extreme cold drop. They, for them, they got to 17. It was a really big deal. But the camellias rebounded just fine from that. Yes. Are there any super cold hardy camellias? And what zone can you get some super hardy ones to? Six. Only six? Only no six. Five. No zone five. Um, the hardiest genetics are Korean. The disadvantage with the Korean genetics is they bloom midwinter when it's way too cold in zone six. So you generally get a living plant without flowers. Um, your best bet for zone six is either April rose because it blooms late or 
a, a fall blooming hybrid like Survivor or Mason Farm. Um, which see the fall blooming hybrids are Sasanqua olivera. Olivera is a species of camellia. It's the oil producing species. They they crush the seed, but it's from high elevations, so it comes naturally from more cold prone regions. So by hybridizing olivera and Sasanqua, they've gotten some prettier flower options, but with better cold hardiness, and they tend to bloom September October before zone six gets really cold. So late blooming japonica, early blooming Sasanqua hybrids are going to be your best bet for zone six. Not a question, but certainly do appreciate the way you organize the talk. It was so Good. easy to make notes and talk. I'm ridiculously type A <laughs> <laughs> and super hyper. <laughs> I guess we better uh, cut questions off because we have yes. no option to do before you. Thanks again. Thank you.